if you remember, we're looking at now kinetics of particles. That's uh, the deal where we've got some uh, interest now in not just what the accelerations, velocities, and positions, all those things are, but how to actually uh, cause a particular acceleration or um, achieve a certain velocity. And so the first of our kinetics solution methods was F equals MA. So we worked on that for a couple days, worked it through it in a, a couple of the different coordinate systems because all of, uh, all of this depends still upon all the um, kinematics that go into it. In fact, it's uh, uh, necessary to bring kinematics into these often as the extra equations needed to find the solutions <coughs> for these problems. But uh, this works real well for general type problems that directly involve the acceleration and or the forces. We're going to look at the second method today uh, very much in the same way we looked at it in Physics 1 last year. Um, a little bit different than the book approaches it. The book kind of winds around a bit uh, and then gets to this a little bit later, but um, generally uh, I think it's, it's the pieces are all straightforward enough that uh, if we get right to it and you uh, read the page or two on each of the individual parts of it, it goes pretty well uh, that way. There's, there's much more detail we can look at uh, as we go through it. And then in a little bit we'll uh, get to the impulse momentum equation. And then we'll do all three of these again once we look at rigid body motion. But right now we're doing just uh, doing just um, particle motion, treating everything as if it's a particle. So the work energy method, and you can go through the uh, development of each little part of it in the book. But uh, most of it is so straightforward, I think it's a little more useful just to uh, get to the use of it once we've established a, a little bit of the parts as we're going. Uh, the work term, actually our book uses uh, not a W but a U. Work is defined as the integral from some point to another, and that's very important to remember, that work as we're defining it is not being done if there isn't movement from one place to another of some type. There's usually a force causing that movement or involved in that movement somehow. Uh, friction doesn't cause these movements, but it does certainly affect the movement, so that's clearly one of the forces we'd be using. Dotted with the displace the uh, differential uh, displacement vector. Now there's a couple really important parts to all of this that we really need to look at. The first is that dot that we have in there. If you remember from what we looked at in um, physics one some time ago, as we have some force acting on an object that's undergoing some movement, and I'll arbitrarily pick a direction for the force and a direction for the motion. Bless you. This guarantees for us, even if F is not constant, this guarantees for us, this dot product, that we're only using the component of the force that's in the direction of the motion itself. That's what the dot product does. The component of the force in the direction of the motion gives us exactly this. So for this little example then, the work is simply the component in the x direction times however total much movement there might be overall in the S direction. Uh, getting to that point is assuming that the B 
the uh, force is constant, so that that makes the integral very simple. That's real important that we keep an eye uh, that we have to have the component of force that's in the direction of the motion. The other component of the force, F, uh, maybe we'll say V in a vertical direction, does not contribute to the work. It may affect the work that's being done because that component of the force might increase the normal force, which might increase the friction force. If the friction force increases, then the work done by the friction increases. So it's not that we can ignore that, but it does not contribute your life directly to the work being done by F itself. The other part, well, there's two other parts that are real important to us. First is just the integral. That means if this force varies with this position, we need the area under the force uh, position diagram. And if it varies in direction or has components of direction, we can do that in either of the component directions. So this is also very important uh, as a notion for us, especially if we have rather uh, uh, well-behaved forces, uh, forces that are constant for a certain section uh, and then change to a different constant or ones that change uniformly uh, as a linear function or some other well-known function, which makes it much easier to do these integrals. You can either calculate the area directly or actually do the integral um, analytically, if you wish. The other part that's very important, and this may be uh, as important as any other part of this, uh, and is also the more subtle part of what's in here. It's that this is um, only going to give us anything if we take into account that we're going from one place to another. Where one and two are, are whatever locations are that we had on the on the uh, integral there. In physics and engineering, we call something like this where it's the integration from one point to another. And in fact, to highlight that, I'll even put uh, subscript indices on here that says the work done going from point one to point two, place one to place two. We call a function like this a path function. Because the work done depends upon the path taken. Of course, you can see that if we have to have some force position diagram where there's some dependence upon the force, whatever it may be, as we go from point one to point two, If the work done going from there, from one point to the other, it depends upon the area, then it also depends upon how we get from one place to the other, because the path determines what the area is. If we take two different paths from one to the other, then we're going to get two different areas, and we'll get two different amounts of work being done. Uh, on whatever our object is by a force that varies in that way. This isn't something you don't know from your personal experience. Sometimes when there's something you need to do, it's easier to go one way than the other. And quite often you think about this a little bit, especially if you're doing something simple like trying to move some, some furniture from one place to the other. So it's very important that we keep these three ideas in mind. This deal of the uh, dot product, <coughs> the fact that the force can vary with position, so we need the area under there. Um, we have other ways we can deal with forces that vary with time. 
This is uh, the easiest way to do it if it varies with position. And also remember that it's uh, very important, not only that we're going from one place to the other, but how we do that. All three of those affect the value we're going to get for the work being done upon some object as we look at the work energy method. Another place, uh, it's a bit subtle as we think about these types of things, is that there might be friction in a problem. If we're moving left to right, then the friction is going to be acting right to left. And that is also part of the work being done. It's uh, convenient, I'll put a little F there for the work being done by the friction. It's convenient that it's always parallel to the direction of motion so that it comes to be minus because it opposes the direction we're moving that would come out directly in the dot product anyway times the distance moved. Uh, that again also is assuming that the friction doesn't change. It's very easy to come up with problems where the friction does change from place to place. You simply do that if you're pushing something across the floor and you go from the linoleum to the carpet uh, and then to hardwood, if you will. Any of those are going to change the friction. Um, easy enough to just separate that into three different sections, calculate each of them independently and add them up. So the friction, in our cases, always does negative work. And we're going to have to keep that in mind. Uh, it's easy to misplace that a little bit. Um, for the units, on any of these, of course, we have units of newtons times uh, distance, force times distance is going to be newton meters, or foot pounds, or pound inches, or something like that. And we use this opportunity, if you remember, to define the um, customary unit of work, the joule. Equivalent to one newton doing work for one meter in that same direction. Same direction as the force, whatever it might be. So any component of a force is equivalent to work. Uh, one newton will give us a joule of work. All right. That should be a, a bit of a refresher from Physics 1, I hope. Um, make sure you read through the book to, to see some of the more details on it. But now, let's look at the entire work energy equation uh, as sorted out piece by piece in the book over several pages. Read through those just for a reminder of what the, each of the pieces are. Um, we'll talk about the pieces um, as we go through them and use them now, especially since some of the, uh, some of the uh, letters used are a little bit odd on some of these, uh, as our author chose it. Plus, I use a slightly different notation to help uh, remember some of the other ideas. There's a couple things we can do with the work that we do on an object. We can change its speed. So we have a change in kinetic energy term here. Most of you remember that uh, kinetic energy is one half mv squared, so this is the difference in that velocity or the the uh, kinetic energy contra contribution of the velocity between the two places, whatever two places in the problem we're talking about. Why our book chooses T for kinetic energy, I'm not real sure, but that's what they do, so it's easy enough for us to do that too. 
Yeah, rhymes with K. That's, that's, that is helpful when they do that. Um, the units on this, <coughs> since it's equal to the units over here, which are Newton meters, um, I don't know that it's of great value to go to joules and come back again, so uh, often it's not staying in Newton meters. Work the units on the kinetic energy. I hope you instantly know, because if these two values are equal in any way, they better have the same units. But you can double check since mass is in kilograms, velocity is meters per second, so that'll be squared. We'll have kilogram, meters per second squared, it's an extra meter, and we get newton meters. That's real important. We've got to watch the units on every one of these pieces to make sure that they all go together right. We're going to have some much more complicated problems than we had in Physics 1 but they can all be broken down into very small problems that are actually rather easy to do. We can change the speed of an object with work we're doing on it. We can also raise or lower it through a gravitational field. So our book happens to use a V for potential energy. This is the change in the gravitational potential energy. This is mg delta h, where h is simply the height change in the direction of the gravitational field. In other words, parallel to the gravitational field vector. That sometimes tricks students up a little bit because it's certainly possible to look at some problem where we move a mass from one place to some other place that's above and over from the first one. The only concern with the gravitational potential energy is the change in height. There's no concern with that sideways motion because the sideways motion is not parallel to G. This is work being done uh, against the weight vector and the weight vector is always straight down so we're working against that. We only have a concern with vertical changes in position. No horizontal component comes into it. And the last little bit of the work energy equation is if we have an elastic medium, which in our case will be a, a linear spring, That's the change in elastic potential energy. Now there's a lot of subtle pieces in here, and we're going to have to pay attention to all of them, but some of that will come out with experience. This is one I do a little bit differently than the way it's done in the book. Only in notation though, just uh, because I think there's a chance for uh, error to really creep into these problems using the notation they use in the book. So I use a slightly different one. The potential energy of a spring 
depends upon how much its length has changed from its rest length. Every spring has some length attributable to it when it's unused, fresh, and new out of the box. Call that length L0, will work as good as any. That's the rest length Any change from that rest length will increase the potential energy of the spring. And that's what we're measuring here is the changes in the potential energy. If a spring is stretched longer or squished shorter, either way increases the potential energy of the spring. So we also then have to have some idea of the working length of the spring in some problem it may increase by some distance. We can also squish springs up and decrease them. We don't need to use any different indicator for that because we're not going to use those lengths directly. What we're going to use is the change in length. which means change in length from the rest length. I like to use a little del. The book does this the same way, only they use an X in there, which I think is problematic because a lot of times X would mean the position uh, in the horizontal direction in a problem as it is, which uh, means there can be confusion with the different x's in the problem. We just define it as the working, the current working length in a problem minus whatever the rest length was. And then the change in kinetic energy is the difference between whatever that is at the second point squared minus whatever it was originally in the problem. Either one of those may be, the spring is at the rest length, but either one of those may also not be at the rest length. It depends on the problem. It's very easy to set up any problem to do any kind of those. <clears throat> what are the, uh, the units for this term? Why do you laugh? Because you know. If these are all equal and addable to each other, addabatable, addab, what? If we can add these things together, they must all have the same units. So we know this must have units of newton meters or joules. Let's double check though. Uh, remember what the unit is on the spring constant or the spring strength or the spring modulus? Newton's per meter. Newtons per meter. How many newtons it takes to stretch that spring or compress it one meter? We're dealing with linear springs that have uh, the same spring constant in either direction. It takes a newton to squish it a meter. It takes a newton to stretch it a meter. And of course these are units of length, but they're squared. So this as well will have units of newton meters. It's very important we watch the units on each one of these as we go through these. We're going to look at some pretty complicated problems. And if you don't watch this stuff carefully, if you get one little minus sign wrong, or forget one little term that needs to be squared, or have one term in the wrong units, you're doing a different problem. A um, couple other things on each of these. The potential energy, the, sorry, the kinetic energy term will always be positive if the, spree, if the speed increases. If we're going faster at 2 than we were at 1, it'll be positive. That's important too because we're always going to need to know what the sign is on these and it's a good chance to check it. It's also 
true that if we have several things changing speeds in these problems, we just calculate this term for each one of them and add them up. In fact, it could be useful to us if we put a summation sign in front of each one of these terms to indicate we may have one or more things undergoing any of those changes at any time. Positive if speed increases, and of course negative if it doesn't, or zero if there's no change in the speed. So it's important to look at any of those um, possibilities as we go through these problems. So I won't write down that it'll be negative if it decreases, or zero if it doesn't change. Um, I'll just say and etc. And we'll pay attention to these as we go. Notice there's a difference in the characteristic of this term than there was in the work term. Remember I called the work term on this side a path function, meaning that what path was taken between points one and two was of vital importance to the actual value of this work term. This depends only upon the speed at point two and the speed at point one. It doesn't have any dependence whatsoever on the speed in between there. It can go up to the speed of light, come back down to zero, go to negative speed of light, do whatever it wants. All we care about is what was its speed when it started, what was its speed when it stopped. We don't care about any other point. That then is known as what we call a point function. A path function depends upon what's done in between the start and the finish. A point function does not. That actually makes things an awful lot easier. It's a lot easier to just look at the two points, see what the velocities are there, and not have to worry about much else. Not true with the work term, but it is true with that term. The gravitational potential energy term is always positive if the height of our object or objects, there may be several different things changing heights, but if the height increases, then that term will be positive. These are very useful things. They help us anticipate what's going to happen. Also, as most important, helps us double check all these things as we go along. And of course, I can add and etc., meaning the same kind of thing as then over here. Positive if height increases, negative if it decreases, zero if it doesn't change for any one of the objects in there. If we have more than one object, we just do this calculation for each one of the objects and add them up. It's, uh, it all, it's, it's very much like a, an accounting problem. You just have to keep track of the different items, add them all up at the end, see what's left over. Is this a path? or a point function. Point function only depends upon the height when we started and the height when we finished. Nothing else in between matters. Makes it much easier to use. And that part, of, uh, that's due to the fact that uh, uh, the gravity vector and the Gravitational field vectors only in a single direction. This one's a little bit more difficult than um, the other one is because there's a lot of possibilities of whether or not it's going to be positive or not. Uh, so I can't really make this kind of statement here because there are situations where the length will increase but the potential energy of the spring will decrease. Can you think of one that, that would be the case where the length of the spring would increase, but the potential energy would decrease? If it starts heavily compressed and decompresses a little bit, its length will increase, 
but its potential energy will decrease because there was more potential energy in it when it was very compressed, not nearly as much potential energy when it's less compressed. So this one you have to pay a lot more attention to it. Um, I don't even know what I can say here. Uh, I guess I'll just say and etc. right from the start because I can't put anything before that. We have to pay attention to that problem by problem as we go through it. So, uh, kind of vague, kind of wimpy. That's due to the nature of, the, of, of springs that they increase in potential energy uh, on either side of the uh, rest length. Path or point function. Have one vote. No votes. Point. Point. Point function. It only depends upon the length before and the length afterwards. Another thing of great value and interest to us in this is it only depends upon the length of the spring. It does not depend at all on the angle of the spring, the direction in which the spring is pulling. It depends only on the length of the spring. Depends only upon del at the different positions. One other thing. And let's see, I have, uh, I think I have 11 people in this class, one, and they're all here. 11 people, my experience says that at least two of you will fall for this simple trap. Notice that we have a v squared minus v squared term there. We have a del squared minus del squared term there. So I give everybody this warning. Two of you, two out of 11 is about my experience. Two of you will get caught by this at some time during the next week or two. Uh, I'll just use a general variable for uh, the V and the del because it's an algebraic truth that x2 squared minus x1 squared does not equal x2 minus x1 squared. Two of you, yeah, don't give me that face, two of you will get caught by that sometime during the term. And, and the rest of us thank those two for, for taking the bullet. Would, would anybody like to volunteer right off? Thanks, Phil. Says Alan, if I remember the physics one partner. You never did it. I don't know. I'll have to, I'll, I video, or I mean, I photocopy everything you ever turned in to me. I'll go back and check it. Pull it so, up. Don't get caught by that. It seems incredibly simple. Uh, a thing to be caught by, but those are sometimes the things most easily doing the catching. Because you're concentrating on the harder stuff, the easier stuff slips through uh, a lot of times. All right, um, I think that's uh, all the general setup we need. So it's time to start doing some problems that are more complex right from the start that we would have done in uh, in uh, physics one. Leave that up here. We might maybe we'll call it uh, Allen's law. <laughs> you, couldn't, you, couldn't, you couldn't say that naming for something a little more complicated. Well, uh, since we're taping, I didn't want to use your last name. All right, so let's let's start setting up uh, some more difficult problems. All right, here's uh, here's one just to get us started. Uh, jet plane, you can tell it's a jet plane, not my car. My car has wheels and not wings. 
Unless I push the button and the wheels come out and the wings go in. Uh, a jet plane uh, launching from an aircraft carrier is going to have two, two sources, two uh, forces exerted on it to get it up to some speed. First, the engines will be on, and they'll be on full. So let's say that that's uh, 140 kilonewtons. And we'll take that to be a, uh, a constant. The thrust is constant, which it pretty much is. They, they open the engines full before they do anything to get started. Let's give a mass to the plane. There you go, Chris. Like that, that's what you saw in the, the book. That, okay. Means 10 to the 6th. Oh, did you, did you think this maybe meant 10 to the 6th kilograms? Because this is 10 to the 6th grams. Just like a kg is 10 to the 3 grams. That's a megagram, right? This is a megagram. It's like a, a box of 24 chocolates on Valentine's Day. That's a megagram as well. There's also, if you've seen aircraft carrier launches, they attach a catapult, uh, a hook to the bottom of the plane to help get it up to greater speed in a much shorter distance than the thrust alone would do. And that catapult force varies with position along the uh, along the deck. It uh, actually starts out low, comes very quickly to a peak, and then pretty much drops off linearly. This first part happens very quickly, so we'll we'll ignore that for this problem and just assume a linear variation for the whole thing. But that varies between about 65 kilonewtons up to a maximum of about 100 and it does that over about a 90 meter length of uh, ship deck. So let me double check. I think that's all the pieces. Again, we'll assume a, a constant, uh, that initial part of the, oh sorry, this isn't 100, this is 1100. 1100 kilonewtons here is the final force. All right. So we want to find the final velocity, the launch velocity. Once the catapult's done its part, then what is the velocity? Now we could do this by finding out what the acceleration is, except the force varies with position, which makes finding the acceleration that is not constant a t little bit tougher problem. But if we use the work energy equation, it becomes pretty easy. It's very, the work energy equation is very easy for things that are position dependent, especially if the force is position dependent. So, let's start with the work energy equation. Are any parts of this zero? If so, we're already doing a smaller problem. Is there any work being done by any forces like, oh, I don't know, thrusts and catapults? And these, these catapults are generally not an elastic type thing. They're usually steam driven. Um, so this is certainly not zero because we do have forces acting over a certain distance. Is there any change in speed? Yes. Of course, that's the whole point. We're trying to get it up to launch velocity in the short distance of the deck. Any change in gravitational potential energy? 
look at nothing more than did it change height? Did anything in the problem change heights? Nothing did, so we're already at a smaller problem. And this catapult is not a spring activated mechanism. So there's no elastic medium in it either. So we're already working at a very much smaller problem. So a work being done by two components, we'll just calculate them separately and add them up. One is being done by the force, the thrust, and one is being done by the catapult. We can just add them up. Calculate them separately and add them up. That's one of the things that makes this work energy problem uh, method so easy to use. It's just, uh, you can break it into as many small pieces as you want and then just add up all the pieces at the end. All you have to do is keep track of all the minus signs, all the squares. Since the force of thrust is constant, and it acts over the same 90 meters of the launch it's, and in the same direction. It's just simply the uh, constant thrust times the distance the thrust acts. If the thrust, sh if it shut off early or starts late or something, we just change that distance. Calculate for only the distance it actually works. Now we've got catapult force that changes with position linearly. So we need to integrate this. But if we're assuming it's linear, then we don't need to do anything more than calculate the area under the graph. easy. We just have to watch the units. Since the thrust is in kilonewtons and so is the uh, catapult force, we might as well just leave that and we'll have kilojoules rather than kilonewtons uh, rather than joules regular. So that one's easy. It actually is the area under the thrust graph. It's just a constant. It doesn't change. So it's very easy to calculate that area. All right, so I'll let you calculate the force, uh, sorry, the work done by the thrust. It's positive because it's in the same direction as the motion is. between the wheels and the deck and air resistance of the plane because you can imagine they pick up pretty good speed. And they have to practice these launches and landings. So when my brother-in-law came to our wedding, he needed to practice some landings, so he went to the naval base, borrowed one of their planes, and flew out to the wedding and it U.S. government jet plane and practice a fake landing in Syracuse, painted on the tarmac there. They have an aircraft carrier painted. He practiced uh, grab, grab, grabbing the landing hook, then rented the car and came to the wedding. Show off. I still stole the day. Got a little tuxedo. All right, you figure out the work done by the catapult, and then I'll do it, and we'll see if we get the same thing. We're still just working on this left-hand side now. Watch your positive signs, watch your units, 
Watch your squared terms, if any. I know there's a temptation just to dump everything into the equation as a whole. Especially when it's small like this, it's not too big a deal. But when these get bigger, when all four terms are here, these problems get very, very complicated. And it's tremendously easy to lose a minus sign, screw up a unit, square term it shouldn't be, or vice versa. All right. Ignore, ignore this very, very sharp part at the front here. Just assume it's linear from the 1100 newtons all the way to the end of the launch. Where it finally lets go. It still has 65 newtons of force on it, but you're at the end of the catapult, end of the ramp by then, I mean, end of the deck. Okay, all you need to do is integrate this function. function, if we figure that out, we can just integrate it. However, it might be a little bit easier to just calculate the area under the graph. That's all that integration is going to give us anyway. So the area of a triangle is one half the base times the height. So that's one half. The base is 90 meters. The height is 1100 minus 65. That's what? 1035 kilonewtons. Is that right? 1035, 1100 minus 65. Um, and what's that equal to? Anybody have it? 46575. That's kilonewton meters. Who got that for the work done by the catapult? Nobody? Build in? Got it now. Got it now. Now a lot of people did not get this. Got something else? Got about twice that. Chris, what did you get? Did you get this? I just saw the last thing. We're not doing that yet. You didn't. You didn't even have to do this integral. I said it all together. Well, fine. But now we can't check the individual parts. We need to check this part. Travis, you got this number. Did you, Anthony? Yeah. Yeah, Samantha, this number is not right. You got something else? What'd you do? Did you do something else besides this? This, this is, remember, this is the thrust, this is the catapult, and this is just the area under the triangular part. What about this area? That area is also under the graph, also needs to be included. So that's 65 times 90. 65 kilonewtons for 90 meters. The area under the graph doesn't just stop where there's some kind of change in the function, it's all the way down to the axis. And if this was a negative force, we'd have negative area, it'd still work out just fine. What's this value? Anybody have that? The 65 times 90. Bill? 5,850. Oh, this is kilonewton meters. 
So uh, that's over a 10% error, ne neglecting that part down there. All right, now we've got all the pieces. The entire area under the any of the force diagrams, that includes this one from uh, the 140 all the way down to zero, all of that adds up to be Sixty-five megajoules, sixty-five thousand kilojoules or kilonewton meters. All right, so that's the the first term here. Then done. Now we have the delta T part. One half m, which we have v two squared minus v one squared, starting from rest. So that part zero. We're okay with that. Uh, that means delta t is going to be positive. Is that right? Yeah. We only have to look at one thing. Is it picking up speed? Yes, it is. And so we can figure out that term. Watching the units, make it 24. Actually, if we leave it in megagrams, then we're going to have kilonewtons, won't we? And uh, the V2, V2 is what we're looking. Is that going to give us the right units, kilonewtons, meters, if we leave that in megagrams? If we leave this in megagrams, will we get kilonewton meters from this? Assuming that the velocity is in meters per second. Well, let's see. 24 times 10 to the third kilograms. Is that right? Is that a megagram? Times whatever the velocity is in meters per second squared. So the kilogram meters second second squared, that's a newton meter. So this is a kilonewton meter. So if we leave this like that, then uh, we're already okay. Because we just have to change this back to get kilonewtons. That's a newton meter. That's going to be a kilonewton meter. So we're okay. And now we have a very simple problem. It just says 65 megajoules. Actually, we want that in kilojoules. Because everything else was. equals 24 v2 squared, and we already know that that's going to be in kilojoules as well. Uh-oh, one half. Got one half. So that's just 12. Right? So 
So that's a pretty simple problem to solve. Should get about how many meters per second? 2,327.4. Really? 73.7. Yeah, about 74 meters per second. Check your number, John. Did you do the square and the square root? What did he do? That Mach 6 and 98. Oh. This is a new version. Yeah, well, I bet that's what my brother in law would do. Just screeching around. I mean, Tom uh, Cruz with Miles. All right, simple problem. I know some of you just went ahead and put the 1 half mv delta, delta v squared in there, solve for it. Um, you can if you want. But if you mess up a minus sign, or a squared, or a unit conversion somewhere, don't come whining to me. But we're going to do harder problems now. And if you put them all together, everything goes into the work energy equation, you're going to make a mistake sometime. Because you're doing one really big problem instead of a four really little problems. All right, so here's, here's the next thing we'll, uh, we'll look at. <coughs> okay. Over here against a solid wall, we have a spring attached to a collar that rides on a rod. Okay. So good so far. Now, attached to that collar is also a cable that goes up to a pulley where it's pulled by a, a particular constant force. All right, so some of the other things we'll need. Spring constant, 80 newtons per meter. The mass of the collar, 50 kilograms. The force up here, 300 newtons. The rest length, of the spring is a meter. And now you'll need three dimensions, three distances. So from here to about there is 1.3, sorry, 1.233 meters. The collar goes from there to right below the pulley, and obviously not to scale. That's a distance of 1.2 meters. So the drawing's not quite to scale, but uh, as long as we have all these values, we're okay. And the pulley is at a height of 0.9 meters. over the rail itself. Let me make sure, I believe it starts from that position. Okay, 
So it goes from point A to point B along the frictionless <coughs> rod. Find the velocity at point B if it starts from rest. Very depend, this problem depends a lot on the position of everything. We've got springs, we've got velocities at different distances. So start with the work energy equation. Are any parts of it zero? Let's make the problem smaller. Right now it's a four-part problem. Let's see if we can make it into a two or a three-part problem. Any parts of it zero? Is there any work being done by things other than the gravitational force or some elastic force, which would take care of somewhere else? So this is any other force but one of those. Is this force doing some work on it? Of course it is. It's pulling on it and it moves some particular distance, so we know that term's not zero. Is there any friction in the problem? No. This is, this is, we got it from your house. It's all greasy. Is there any change in speed? <coughs> Yeah, that's the whole problem. It's starting from zero. We need to find the final velocity. That's how we're going to get it is there. Is anything changing height? At least anything that has a significant mass. Yeah, some of the cable is changing height because it gets pulled up over the pulley, but it's of insignificant mass compared to the 50 kilograms. So nothing is changing height. Problem's a little bit smaller. And do we have an elastic medium in the problem whose length changes from start to finish? And yeah, we do. So that term's not zero. So let's do them one at a time. That way we can watch their signs in their units and pick out any other particular problems in these. Uh, this one's a little bit tricky because the force that force P is in that direction for a little while. And it ends up like that. And we have to integrate the that vector, that force vector, dotted with the position, the distance as it moves along in the horizontal direction. Sound easy to do? Who wants to do that integration for us? Set it up. Well, you, somebody set it up and somebody else will do it. Split the effort there. Travis, you're just going to wait for somebody to do it? There's a much easier way to do this. Anybody see what it is? David, you see these kind of things sometimes. Instead of doing this integration where the vector is the same in magnitude, but it changes in direction as we move in that distance. So remember at every place, and I'm only drawing a few of them, we need to know this continuously. Every place we need to know the force and the direction of motion. The vertical part doesn't contribute anything to the work because there's no movement in the vertical direction by the mass. But there's a much easier way to do this problem. Anybody see it? Huh? Area of what? That triangle? I'm going to trust you guys. I'll take this off. 
kind of getting in the way. Chris, do you see an easier way to do that integral? Not a pleasant integral to set up, not a pleasant integral to do. David? The function of force seems to be the derivative of a circle, circular equation. I don't know, it could be. That doesn't sound easier, though. Okay. That sounds harder. By easier, I mean real easier. Use the component of the force that's in the direction of motion. Yeah, well, that's constantly changing, though. That's the trouble. It continuously changes from whatever that is down to finally zero right there. And that's the trouble, that the component and the direction of motion is continuously changing. Now we could figure out how. We could figure out the, you know, that's the, maybe the cosine of the angle and the derivative of that, but there's a much easier way to do it. Well, come on, Alan, you see this kind of stuff all the time. The easier ways to do, sometimes you're wrong, but it is easier. Make a, make a graph and take your own graph. This is the force doing the work. That force is going to move from right here to some position right there. Could we figure out that distance? Because that would be that force moving in that direction. It would be force times distance. Can we figure out that distance delta s? Yeah, it's, it's just the difference in length between the cable there and the cable there. It's very easy to figure out. So this is going to be P delta S. That's the, uh, we don't have to worry about the fact that the force on the uh, collar changes because this is the same force up there doing the work. We just need to know what delta S is. So that's 300 newtons. Delta S, let's see, it, it, it was, let's see, 1.2 meters squared minus 0.9 meters squared square root. Is that right? That's, that's this length originally. Is that right? Just just this right triangle. You know, we're ignoring the thickness of the, uh, remember this is particle motion we're looking at. Yeah. Just take off the second half of the battery. Huh? Minus 0.9 meters. Minus 0.9 meters. Why are you subtracting anything? Oh yeah, I don't want to subtract it, I want to add it. I was getting set to subtract it there. Sorry, that's that's the hypotenuse here, this original distance. Maybe we'll call that D. Is that right now? And the difference between those two, let's see, we need another set of brackets in here. much of the cable gets pulled up over the pulley and moves along in the direction delta s. For those of you that want to check, go ahead and integrate this and you see it's the same. I think I'm not going to do it. I hate integration almost uh, too much to do this. Huh? You've already integrated it? In your head? I, uh, yeah, I wrote some of it down here and then I, then I did some of the rest of my head. Yeah, yeah I did it in my head too. I did it this way. Yes, yes. All right, do the units work? We get Newton meters. Is it going to be positive? Should it be positive? Sure. 
Why sure? That's the way you're pulling on it, and that's the way you want it to go. Because the force and the movement are in the same direction. So yeah, that's positive. So what's that come out to be? Hundred and eighty newton meters, I think. Delta T one half M V two squared or V B squared if you wish. Starts from rest. So that's easy. We're looking for V two. We've got everything else. All we have to do is check the units. 25 kilograms times meters squared per second squared will be newton meters. So that's all that that term disappears to. Delta V E, we have the spring constant. Some of these problems are going to have to look for it. Are either of those two terms zero? It's got a little bit of stretch in it. Came out of the box at one meter. We've got it attached to start the problem at 2.1.223. And then we stretch it all the way out even farther. So that is not going to be, either of those are going to be zero. So what's del 2? What is the working, uh, the change in length from rest length when the uh, collar is all the way out of B? Our, our last point, 4.3. It's these two added, 1.433 minus the rest length. So that's uh, 1.433 meters squared. That's L2 minus L0, and then that's squared. And that will give us Newton meters, because we have Newtons per meter times meter squared. And the original del is 1.233 minus the rest length. Don't forget, this is not the length of the spring at any point. It's the change, the difference between it and its rest length. Sure. First L, V2.4. The, the total distance here is 2.433, but minus the rest length. So this is L1 minus L0. You send it right back at 80. What? It sends it right back to 80. What do you mean it sends it right back to 80? 79. Oh, that's what this all equals? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, more coincidence than anything, I believe. Is that Newton meters? Yeah. We have Newtons, meters. Yeah, that'd be Newton meters. Now we have a very easy problem to solve. Uh, should that be positive? Should this term be positive? Oh, we didn't. Should this one be positive too? We need to check both of them before we go any further. If we made a mistake on the sign, we might as well fix it before we go to solve it. Uh, this should be positive. It picks up speed. That's all we need to look at. This is stretched to start with, stretched even more to finish with. So that should also be positive, and that worked out. So now our problem 
becomes very, very simple. 180 newton meters from the work term equals 25 V2 squared. It's also newton meters as long as the velocity is in meters per second uh, plus 80 newton meters. That's a pretty easy problem to solve. It's a very small problem now. If you wanted to, and I know some of you do because there's at least half the class that never, never follows me on this, these work energy problems, loves to put everything together right from the start and work it out a lot from there. I don't understand how your, your elastic is uh, positive. There, right there in the middle there. That's the equation with everything put in the original work energy term all the way across. And you've got to make, you've got to solve this for VB or what I call V2 up there, without making a single negative error, a single square error, or a single unit error anywhere. It can be done, but we've got more complex problems than this one coming up too. And if you want to put them all together in like this, and then guarantee you won't make a single small error like here we checked small problems, didn't make any mistakes. Just a lot less hazard solving this problem and not making any minus sign errors than it was would be solving this one in its entirety. It's doable. I don't like doing it that way. I don't like making minus errors. Alan, you still didn't I, see why this is positive? Well, up in your when you had your work total, um, it just Here? seems like this this with the spring's going to be pulling against your. You got eighty newtons, newton meters pulling against your three hundred at the top. So I don't see how it was positive. This this is not. This is the potential energy of the spring. This is not the work the spring's doing on the peaks. That's the opposite of this. And you'll see that developed in the book. Oh, yeah, yeah. This well, is the potential yeah. energy of the spring. Right, I was seeing it as potential negative energy. The potential to pull it in the opposite direction where prime go. So it seems like that potential. Well, if you want to redefine this, yeah, you can. Well, I'm just, I'm just this is the potential energy stored in the spring, which is different than, but it comes from the work done by the spring on the piece. Right. Yeah, I, just, I was just trying to figure out how the potential energy was in the uh, This is potential energy stored in the spring. You have to look at it that way. Okay, that's the end there.